to Jerusalem to the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, of, temple courts, sitting among teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. This is God's word. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, good to see you all here uh, this morning. And as we've got a, a few people away, so as John Joe mentioned, we are a bit stretched for resources. And that means if you are rostered um, on any particular Sunday, and if you're feeling unwell, we don't want you to come, but we would really appreciate if you could let us know uh, beforehand so we can make the necessary arrangements. Uh, let me also commend uh, Tim and Nicola to you to, to support, to get behind them uh, in their ministry. You can do that uh, either directly supporting them, you can uh, get their details from, uh, from them, but also you can do that through the faith pledge system that is available uh, at our church where you can uh, support them and write their names down uh, in whatever way that you choose to give, it'll get to them. So uh, let me commend them to you. Let's pray before we come to God's word, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks and praise again for this beautiful morning, the opportunity for us to sing praises and also, Lord, to hear what you are doing in people's lives, how you are leading them, like Tim and Nicola. Now, Father, as we humble ourselves before your word, we want to give you thanks, and also want to submit ourselves to the work of your Holy Spirit, wherever we are, either we are here in the building or listening to online. May you be honored, and Father, may you work in our hearts to bring honor to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, one of the things that I'm not good at is remembering special days. So if you have received a uh, a wish from me on a, on a birthday or an anniversary. It's not that I remembered it, but I was reminded of that. I was prompted to do that. There are three ways that, I us that usually happens. One is Faustine, who is like a walking memory bank. You tell her once, she remembers that like instantly. It's amazing when we stop to pray in the morning, she'll say, oh, somebody's birthday. Oh, it's that person's birthday or that person's anniversary. So that's one. Second is Facebook reminders. That's amazing. You get reminders every morning. And the third is actually a calendar entry. Uh, so I have uh, intentionally gone and put myself reminders to remind myself of certain things. And the reality is in the midst of ordinariness, isn't it? We, we tend to miss special things. We don't enjoy the flowers by the side of the road. We miss the sunsets. We miss the sunrises. We tend to miss the extraordinary stuff, don't we? Now today we, we read one of those ordinary stories uh, that if you are, if you have been part of a Christian family from your birth, you'd have heard this story over and again where Jesus get lost in the, in the temple. And you'd have heard this at Sunday school, you'd have read this story over and over again. It is an ordinary lost and found story. But as we look a bit closer, which we are going to do this morning, you will also find there's something extraordinary. So we're going to look at the, the ordinary first, and then to look at the extraordinary, and finally 
to kind of understand what does this story really mean for us today? What can we learn from this story? First, we meet the ordinary parents, don't we? If you were here last week, we saw Mary and Joseph, the mother and the father of Jesus, were devout Jews. They followed the law carefully. They did all the customs. And here again, verse 41 and 42, Luke says, Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast of Passover. And now when Jesus was 12, in one of the very important years, because next year, he will become an official adult. He will be responsible for his decisions. So they take Jesus along with them. You see, Mary and Joseph, they're not doing anything special. They're being like any other ordinary Jew. And it is here they lose track of Jesus. Now, I'm sure uh, Mary and Joseph were not the first parents to lose a child in Jerusalem. And some of you here may have those gut-wrenching feelings of losing a child in a, in a shopping mall or, or in, in a stadium. Um, the Passover was a, a great big feast where Jews from all over the world were expected to come and celebrate it in Jerusalem. So there would have been at least 200,000 people in this small city. And it was easy for... Uh, for a child to be lost, to be misplaced in the crowd. And like normal parents, we are told that Mary and Joseph were so anxious and worried, and they would have played this blame game, didn't they? They would have said, well, Joseph, I thought he was with you. And Mary says, no, I thought you were supposed to pick him up from the temple. And like ordinary parents, they go all the way back. They do anything for their child. And they go all the way back to Jerusalem to look for their son. And when they find him after three days, they were relieved. But they were also annoyed, weren't they? There's, this, there's a touch of frustration when, when Mary says, Where have you been? Where have you been? I'm going, going ahead a couple of slides. Where have you been? Why have you done this to us? Sounds familiar? And, and also they couldn't understand really what Jesus was saying. And have you tried listening to a, a teenager? You would have kind of come out, what on earth are you talking about? And here are Mary and Joseph, trying to understand a to-be teenager, an ordinary parent. Jesus' parents were ordinary parents. And now we find the ordinary child. An ordinary child. Now Jesus, if you, if you, I mean, some of you, if you see these pictures, don't we, on on cards or on the internet where Jesus is walking around with a halo and like, but Jesus wasn't. He didn't have a special donkey to, to, to go on and he didn't have a halo around his head as he was walking around. Like every other teenager, he was curious and adventurous. He asked questions. Like every other child, he had all the answers to all the questions. He got scolding and his mom got annoyed with him for doing something naughty. I don't know about you, when you read verse 49, I get a bit uneasy. Although Jesus was telling the truth, he was a bit rude, wasn't he, to his mom? Don't you feel that? I don't know, I feel that. Maybe you don't, but I wonder. I wonder if Luke was perhaps trying to show Jesus' full humanity. Here as a child, he was behaving like an ordinary child. I doubt he sinned. I mean, the Bible says he was sinless, but he was actually childish. But when you look further down, verses 51 to 52, he had to grow up. 
like any other 12-year-old boy. He had to be obedient to his parents, learn how to live with others, how to eat good food and, and grow muscles, had to learn how to pray, how to learn the Torah, how to obey God, had to learn how to share and live with others. See, Jesus was fully human. He was an ordinary man like you and me, and that's why he can sympathize with us, isn't it? But in the midst of this ordinariness, we also find the extraordinary person, don't we? Verse 47, everyone who heard Jesus was amazed at his understanding and the answers that he gave. Even his parents were astonished. They were amazed. Is this our child? He was extraordinary. Although, as I said, verse 49 sounds a bit rude, uh, it also confronts us with who Jesus really is, isn't it? He's not just an ordinary child. He is the Son of God. On the King James Version, uh, as I should be about my father's business. Now, in the original Greek, the word business or house is not found. It just says, in the of my house. And so the New Testament translation, translators had to actually find a word to put. So some use business, some say house. Regardless of which words that you want to use, Jesus reveals that he is the Son of God who has come to carry out the mission of his father, God. He has come to do his business. And if you remember the, the first couple of chapters, first few, uh, first chapter and, and up to chapter, two, uh, chapter two, uh, all this time, other people have been talking about Jesus, haven't they? Angels from heaven, Zechariah, an old priest, and his wife, Elizabeth, Mary, the mother of Jesus, a group of shepherds, and last week we saw Anna and Simeon. Now Jesus himself speaks for the first time in this gospel, and he confirms all what we have heard about him so far. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the second person of the Trinity. The word became flesh. God is, Jesus is God's promised Messiah, the one who has come to save sinners. You see, friends, in the middle of the ordinary, Luke doesn't want us to miss the extraordinary, the uniqueness of Jesus. He was fully God, fully man. He was here to do his father's business, saving sinners and bringing them home. Extraordinary in the middle of the ordinary. So what can we learn from this story? What can we learn from this story? I want to share three application points with you this morning. First, don't let the ordinariness of Jesus to cloud your view who Jesus really is. Many people today are impressed by his teachings, his miracles, and, and treat him as, as a guru or, or, a, or a teacher, a miracle worker, a revolutionary, perhaps a, a, a good, really good man. But as we read the, the stories, not just this one, but as we read the Gospels, we find that Luke doesn't allow us, the Gospel writers doesn't allow us to treat him as just another teacher or a guru or a special man. No, he confronts us with Jesus' own words. I am the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity who has come to do the business of my Father. Now, some of you would have read the Chronicles of Narnia, which was written by uh, C.S. Lewis. And he also wrote a book called Mere Christianity. It's a really good book if you want to read. And in this, he wrote this. I'm going to read this one. You can follow it on the screen. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, which is Jesus that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. 
That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option to us, open to us. He did not intend to. Luke invites us, doesn't he? You and me, especially if you are not a believer. Do what Mary did. She could not understand what all this means. But she did not brush them off as childish talk. No, she, she treasured them in her mind. She pondered until she could put all these pieces together. So let me invite you to do the same this morning. Investigate his claims. Consider coming to the Christianity Explode course on the 6th. Maybe perhaps you want to bring someone along with you. Don't let the ordinariness of Jesus to cloud his uniqueness. Secondly, don't let your righteousness or religiousness, sorry, religiousness to cloud your view of Jesus. As we noticed last week and this week, Mary and Joseph were loaded with piety, devoutness. They were practicing law-abiding Jews. But in verse 50, Luke tells us, still they did not understand what Jesus was saying to them. And you kind of wonder, isn't it? Of all the people, Mary should have got it. She had the benefit of the angels, the virgin conception, the shepherds, the, the witness of uh, Simon, Sim Simeon, and Anna, but she didn't for some reason. Now, it's not wrong to be religious and follow rituals, but we must be careful that we don't allow religiousness or rituals or customs to replace who Jesus is and what he has done. Now, this was a problem is the, with the first century Jews, isn't it? They placed those customs and rituals above Jesus, and they couldn't see Jesus who he, for who he is. And sometimes they added these rituals and, and customs as, as part of becoming a Christian. They said, well, to be a Christian, you must believe in Jesus plus do all these list of things. Not just the Jews, right? If we are not careful, we too can do the same, can't we? We may think our going to church every Sunday, our tithing very carefully, our prayers in the morning and in the evening, our baptism, taking communion every Sunday or once a month, we may think somehow all this will add to what Jesus has already done 2,000 years ago on the cross. No. We must remember that his death on the cross and his resurrection was sufficient for all time to save us and to make us holy and blameless and to present us blameless before God. Paul tells the Galatian church, mark my words, he says, Paul, I tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you all. What is he saying? Christ died in vain if you had to do your own work to get to God. Friends, be religious. Be devout. Follow rituals if you have to, because sometimes for some people, it is helpful to have these habits or customs. 
but don't let them obscure your view of what Jesus has done for you. Don't trust in them. But use them to keep Christ at the center of your life, not the other way. Don't let the religiousness, the rituals, the customs to obscure your view of who Jesus really is. Finally, we all must rediscover Jesus. We must take time to rediscover Jesus. For Mary and Joseph, it would have been 12 years, 12 years of ordinariness about Jesus, isn't it? The angels, the virgin birth, the shepherds, the prophecies at the temple, that all happened 12 years ago. And 12 years on, I wonder whether for Mary and Joseph, Jesus became somewhat ordinary, normal. And on this particular day, when Mary and Joseph, they were, they were packing their bags to return home from the temple, in the busyness of packing bags, and they, they, they lost track of Jesus. It took one day to realize that Jesus was missing. Perhaps they were too tired. They may have been chatting away with others. Their minds were busy, full with thinking, okay, what, what are the things that we need to do when we get back home? And they lost track of Jesus. So what does God do? God literally turns them around isn't it? on the spot. They, they, God calls them back, back to Jerusalem, where Jesus is. To be confronted with Jesus, to be amazed by Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, to, to remind them, to nudge them that he is extraordinary. Don't lose sight of his extraordinariness. So let me ask you this morning, have you lost Jesus? Perhaps you have been a believer for a while, and Jesus has become normal, ordinary to you. And the busyness of life, work, children, hobbies, friends, social media, stresses, and tiredness, is Jesus non-existent? You don't have time to think about him, you don't have the desire to serve him anymore. And with COVID dragging on and on, the case numbers going high every day, isolation, being not able to come to church regularly. Has your excitement about Jesus grown cold? Have you become like the church in Ephesus that Jesus speaks to in, in the book of Revelation? But I have this against you, that you have abandoned your first love. You don't love Jesus anymore. You're bored with Jesus. You don't see the uniqueness of Jesus. When was the last time you were amazed by Jesus and was excited about him? How long has it been? A few days? A week ago, a month ago, a year ago, perhaps a few years ago, maybe the last time you were so excited about Jesus was the time, the first time you became a believer, became a Christian. Perhaps this morning, God may have stopped you in your tracks. So he can point you back to Jesus to show how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, inviting you to find rest in him. Perhaps in the circumstances of your life, God is prompting you, he's nudging you and leading you to a place where you can see Jesus clearly again and fall in love with him again and to be excited with him again. Perhaps maybe it's time for you and I to start reading a gospel be amazed by Jesus again. When was the last time you read a gospel through? 
Friend, in, in, his, in his amazing grace and love, God humbled himself and took on human flesh. He became like one of us, extraordinary, dwelt among the ordinary. Why did he do that? He did that so that we won't miss him. So let me encourage you this morning. Don't let anything obscure your view of how extraordinary Jesus is. And don't let anything diminish your love, your passion for Jesus. Because it is only by knowing him, by believing in him, and we, we find a relationship, a fruitful relationship with, with God, and, and we find our identity, our, our life, our joy, our peace, and most importantly, our hope for eternity. Take time to rediscover Jesus and be amazed and be blown away by who Jesus is. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for that you sent your only Son, draped in flesh, to live an ordinary life among us, to have ordinary parents, to be lost in a temple, and to be scolded, perhaps, be annoyed at to learn what it means to speak the God who created the heavens and the earth. You learned how to speak, how to walk. And you did all these because you didn't want any of us to miss you. You walked among us, the extraordinary, unique Son of God. So this morning, I pray, may we not lose sight of Jesus. Father, for those who haven't really grasped who Jesus is, Father, I pray that they will see Jesus for who he is and, and put their life in his hand. I pray, Father, for those of us who are really tired and, and, and kind of found Jesus ordinary and, and just normal and we are not so excited about him, Father, please produce excitement in us through your Holy Spirit so that we might be on fire, on passion for Jesus. So, Father, we thank you for reminders, for nudges, for rebukes, so that we can see Jesus again. And we give you, give you thanks now. In his precious name. Amen. Amen.